You have people who are really suffering, who never get their voices really consulted, who are not a part of the process. So it's hard to really address climate change as an issue if it's not intersectional with these other issues. I'm here outside of Shiloh Temple, which is home to one of the first rooftop solar gardens in Minneapolis. Faith communities play an important role in climate solutions in terms of organizing, bringing people together, and making an impact. Today I'm talking with Whitney Terrell, who's an environmental justice organizer with Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, working to bring faith communities together to support just solar. My name is Whitney Terrell and I work for Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light and I am an environmental justice organizer. My work is uh, very much about motivating faith communities in particular, but anyone, you know, faith, consciousness, spirituality, um, just someone who cares about climate to get involved. I grew up in southeast Minneapolis, so I can't claim the south side pride, I can claim <laughs> southeast. So I grew up with like the river in the background. I think what was important to me, like one of the most transformative moments for me in terms of climate, I went to Wolfridge Environmental Learning Center in northern Minnesota, and I saw like Lake Superior and the Sawmill Valley and like literally like something out of a movie, sun rays shining through the clouds and birds flying. And so that for me is actually one of the most important like climate related moments for me and then also just spiritual moments for me. Mm -hmm. So I think about that moment pretty regularly when I need a gut check around like what I'm doing with my life. There were times like after I graduated from college, I'm a proud alumna of Hampton University in Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so coming out of a historically black college and then going to work in an investment bank in New York, I really found myself asking, what am I doing with my life? It really wasn't everything I was interested in. I studied sociology. So I thought I was going there for research and I ended up doing like trading operations. Um, and then I went to a workshop where the bank started talking about trading in water, like trading water rights. And I thought, no, this is not, this doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. So I started traveling, you know, I started really thinking back to that moment in sixth grade where I could revisit what is it that I want to do. So I ended up taking some classes at Columbia and like trying to reground myself in conservation and sustainability and then went to Nicaragua. Once I'd gone an undergrad and then I went again while I was working and the trip focused on environmental justice. So that really was like the affirmation of like, yes, make this switch. So that's where my career changed, but my, my background growing up, um, just having parents who are also very community minded, um, and then my grandmother and my great grandfather, my great grandparents like that, really reminded me to think about like how would I solve these problems related to my own community. From your perspective, what is so um, powerful about that HBCU environment? What really made the difference for me is I got a break from sort of being a minority and had the opportunity to really have my culture centered because I've actually experienced, you know, really significant racial um, events since I've been here whether it's, you know, through the uprisings that happened here or, you know, especially, you know, people speaking to me in a really disrespectful way just on the street. People have been very emboldened over the last several years to just, you know, uh, offer slurs or whatever. I know even for my, me personally, like after experiencing some like, you know, racial um, slurs and things on the street, even like religious slurs, I found it very hard to be outside, which is the honest truth. Yeah. And so for me, like just recently, did I feel like comfortable being outside again, which is so sad, right, as an EJ organizer. So I think for me, like knowing that I had the opportunity to be built up, even if other people don't always see me that way, it really mattered for my confidence to know that I've had the opportunity to be, you know, immersed, to really feel and see myself at a level that I should, even if other people may not. So. That kind of contradiction yeah. that um, sometimes I feel just from people in the world is um, less, it, it's hurtful, but it's less hurtful because I've been built up. You mm -hmm. know, I've been really like deeply loved. Yeah, it's just, it was very much about self-love.
What motivates you to do the work that you do? I think I really feel a connection to like the, the land and like Minnesota as a place. So I've lived in, you know, I grew up here and I've lived in other states, but I literally felt like I needed to be here again, like to wow. be close to the land. So I feel very grateful to be here and it's just very um, healing for me. It's, um, and also the relationships and community. I do this work because I have like a very high level of accountability for um, the different relationships. I'm the fourth generation of my family here, so mm -hmm. this feels like, you know, the relationships of like my great grandfather or I can sometimes run in even to his friends, you yeah. know, like that I want this air, the land, the environment, the water to be clean for them and like even other people I don't know. How did you get to the like the work that you do now? I started off um, really focusing on just attending some of the leadership training programs that MNIPL has. Mm -hmm. So that's where I started and like hosting a climate action circle for the Muslim community and then also eventually came on board to work on how do we think about returning relatives and ways so, or people who are recently or formerly incarcerated and like coming out to um, join the solar energy, uh, solar and, and energy industries. But unfortunately, like because of the prison that it was focused on closed down, um, we pivoted and thought about how could we really support the energy and solar industries to really focus on broadly their DEI strategy. So that's what I've been focused on um, is being a part of those conversations to support the industry and to it's it's kind of like behind the scenes but it's a lot of like one-on-one -on -one conversations supporting leaders who are interested in this change happening. They might not even have like a chief diversity officer. They might not have any trainings going on and they're just interested in starting that change. So my goal is to like support them. You mentioned focusing on organizing with faith yeah. communities, but what is so special about faith communities when it comes to organizing for climate solutions and climate justice? I think that people naturally have some kind of conviction. Mm -hmm. So we want people to go to that extra layer of like thinking about who are they and they don't have to be a part of like a, a congregation or a specific religion even because a lot of the communities we're supporting that's where they're coming from so I'll use an example actually from our line 3 work we were resisting a, a pipeline um, that crossed most of Minnesota line 3 is yeah. what it's known as um, but really it was crossing 200 bodies of water including the Mississippi River but we are following the leadership of Anishinaabe people or Ojibwe people sometimes what they're called and they're one of the main like tribal nations here in Minnesota. So their leadership, the reason why, especially Anishinaabe women were um, participating is to, because that's their role in their culture, to protect water. Mm -hmm. And they would start protests even by like offering tobacco, offering their prayers for tobacco. So a lot of people might've missed that, yeah. but it was also an invitation for people of other traditions to, you know, kind of be in that spiritual mode. It's, there's actually like a prophetic angle for Anishinaabe or Ojibwe people mm -hmm. to resist the pipeline. Like they actually believe in stopping a black snake. So that's really important for me, even though I'm not of their like spiritual background, to actually offer spiritual allyship to say like my personal beliefs and faith is broad enough that I can support them mm -hmm. and be a spiritual ally. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And even when I wasn't working at MNIPL, I was working at the U.S. Green Building Council I was thinking how can they, re I would go to the ministers or I would go to the religious leaders and say like, yeah. please give this message to people quickly. You know, people who are trusted. Imagine um, the Catholic church, if they green all of their building spaces or you know, some of the faiths that are more like hierarchical, you can make a lot of change at one time if they agree to do it. We need everyone to be at the table and there's so many different facts that people are receiving all the time, especially when you start to go in different parts of the state. Um, trust is very important, and especially in smaller communities. And then also, sometimes people who have collars, who have kippahs, who have hijab, like when you show up in person, it can show like, oh, these are people of spirituality. We've seen the power of that in different civil rights movements in the United mm -hmm. States. I think that calls on like this consciousness we have in the country of being, um, you know, morally accountable. Hmm. So they offer moral leadership. What have some of the challenges been on the journey that you've had and how have you navigated those? How, do, how does all of the values we have as community, 
actually like change a system that is not designed with the community in mind? Mm -hmm. How do we build power around that without burning bridges with like relationships you actually need with the energy companies to actually grow? And then also how do we give people enough space and time and energy and care so that they actually can make this a priority on top of everything mm -hmm. else that they have going on? I think that's one of the biggest challenges is managing like the emotional and time commitment yeah. that's required to actually sustain change. Even when we might lose, like we lost, you know, like the pipeline battle. You have to sustain yourself. You have to take care of yourself and then take care of community. Um, so it's been really challenging. A lot of um, systems are just not designed for people who have really intense commitments so they can't really voice their needs because you have people who are really suffering who never get their voices really consulted who are not a part of the process and we just have major issues housing basic needs here so it's hard to really address climate change as an issue if it's not intersectional with these other issues yeah. so like i would never organize in like my own community without thinking about how does this relate to economic development so like the intersection needs to be there in our movement, but I think the problem is like the people who need to be heard, they're not being heard. I hear a lot from people about climate grief, climate anxiety, mm -hmm. and I wonder how do you experience those things and navigate those things, most more importantly. I have a narrative of like longer term struggle that it just doesn't let me get too caught up in the loss for some reason. I feel like I just have to keep pushing and resisting and that is more rooted in hope for me so that I'm able to sustain like my work in it. If you're looking back at your younger self, is there any advice you have for your younger self? Yeah, which is still my current self because I have to think about this advice regularly, yeah. which is like enjoy the journey, focus on like what is the greatest good that I can do. So that, that idea of like doing good um, is very, very significant to me. Um, I adopted a personal motto from my middle school. Shout out again to Trinity School at River Ridge. I really loved the motto they had, which is to seek truth, beauty, and goodness in all things. Mm. So that led me to really think about that in my own life and what that means to me. So doing good is important. Um, yeah. How could people support you and Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light? We would love to see people show up as a part of supporting us or the Just Solar Coalition as we're really trying to encourage our utility to not raise rates by 20% here in Minnesota. We'd love to see people get involved in that to vote according to climate regardless of their party, like what's going to really help with climate. Um, but we're here as a resource to really walk people through all kinds of things, whether they want solar for their congregation or for a small business or for themselves. We have like a whole team dedicated to supporting access to solar. Yeah. Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light is also part of a national network. So there's always um, maybe a chance you'll find a local Interfaith Power and Light in your state. Mm -hmm. Start with like doing that thing that really grounds you in your connection to the environment because that will always give you a deeper why mm -hmm. and then to work on protecting it through advocacy talking about your climate story and letting the people around you who are making those decisions know what's important to you and that you want it preserved and protected. My name is Whitney Terrell and I'm an environmental justice organizer at Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light. I'm helping the world reach drawdown by working with interfaith communities and supporting Just Solar Solutions.